Happy New Year and welcome to worship from the Peninsula Churches in the west coast of Scotland. I hope you'll join us through 2024. We are adjusting the online services a wee bit this year in that we will be streaming a service from one of our churches, either Ardgower or Ardnamurchan, on two Sundays out of each month and keeping this format of recorded prayers and readings and reflections for the other two Sundays. We hope that you'll enjoy the new format and you'll be able to view the services as they take place or whenever it is convenient for you on YouTube. So whatever time you are watching this and wherever you are, welcome to our first service of worship for 2024. Let's worship our God.
let us draw near to our God in prayer. Great wonder, gathering us for adventure, intriguing us with story and gospel, we begin here today in a new epiphany, a new moment of revelation. And we wait and we wonder. Are we ready ourselves for a season of revelation? We think about our language, our metaphors. We play with poetry. But through each, we linger with the possibility of fresh epiphany. One word, one living word at a time. One moment, one holy moment at a time. One Sabbath, one sacred Sabbath at a time. Holy wonder, revelation, moment of mystery revealed. God, we wait, we wait for the adventure that is this season of epiphany. growth, of learning, of new things. So be it. Hear our prayer. We offer it all to you, our God. Amen. From Luke chapter 1 and reading the first four verses. Dear Theophilus, Many people have done their best to write a report of the things that have taken place among us. They wrote what we have been told by those who saw these things from the beginning and who proclaimed the message. And so, Your Excellency, because I have carefully studied all these matters from their beginning, I thought it would be good to write an orderly account to you. I do this so that you will know the full truth about everything which you have been taught. Amen. From John's Gospel, chapter 1, reading from verse 19 to 31. The Jewish authorities in Jerusalem sent some priests and Levites to John to ask him, who are you? John did not refuse to answer, but spoke out openly and clearly, saying, I'm not the Messiah. Who are you then? They asked. Are you Elijah? No, I'm not, John answered. Are you the prophet? They asked. No, he replied. Then tell us who you are, they said. We have to take an answer back to those who have sent us. What do you say about yourself? John answered by quoting the prophet Isaiah. I am the voice of someone shouting in the desert. Make a straight path for the Lord to travel. The messengers who have been sent by the Pharisees then asked John, if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, why do you baptize? John answered, I baptize with water, but among you stands the one you do not know. He's coming after me, but I'm not good enough even to untie his sandals. All this happened in Bethany on the east side of the river Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him and said, There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me, but he is greater than, than I because he existed before I was born. I did not know who he would be, but I came baptizing with water in order to make him known to the people of Israel. 
Amen. May God bless these words to us. Who is he? Who are you? When we first meet a new person, we normally go into either subtle questioning or a more open and direct questioning. Who are you? Where are you from? And what are you doing here? Who are you related to? Do I know any of your relatives? Living in a remote rural area, I think our questions may be more directed towards what is a new person doing in our area and what brought them here than perhaps in an urban area where there may be more measuring up to jobs or lifestyle, what type of car do you drive, where do your children go to school and so on. But once we establish a link with this new person, then we can begin to explore it. Do you know so-and-so? Which school do you go to or did you go to? And this all gives us a basis on which we can build. And I would suggest that even if you try not to do this, there is an element of it in all encounters. To resist really takes some concentration. And I think for the most part, it's not meant to be invasive or impolite. We are trying to find the common ground from which a relationship or an understanding can grow. And our reading today is primarily about John with the introduction from Luke saying he wants to explore the truth about Jesus. He is trying to set all that has happened or has happened in some sense of order. So what if we met John the Baptist, as he is called? Where would we start and what would we make of him? Well, all the four Gospels tell us about John. His birth has been part of our Advent story. Born of elderly parents, Elizabeth and Zechariah, after they'd been visited by an angel who told them that this would happen. Not the usual start of life on a number of accounts, so, so clearly something special. And special John was, and certainly different. We don't know how much he would have known about his start in life, but I would imagine he would have been told that he'd been set apart for a special role. And even his name had been chosen for him, not named Zechari after Zechariah or anyone in the family, but John. Well, we're given a good marker for the time when John began to fulfill his God-given role. We are told in Luke 3 that Tiberius had been emperor for 15 years when John began his teaching. And so that would make the year 29 AD. And this is confirmed by some of the other facts which Luke gives us, that Herod Antipas was ruler of Galilee and Pontius Pilate was ruler of Judah. In our first reading, we heard an extract from a letter to Theophilus from Luke, saying that he wanted to get things in some semblance of order, and this is a fine example of that. So from this, we know that John started his preaching in or around 29 AD. He went around the whole territory around the River Jordan, preaching and baptising. Now, baptising or ritual cleansing was already part of the Jewish faith, and John adopted this practice as part of his message of turning away from sin. He says in Luke, turn away from your sins and be baptised and God will forgive your sins. John was different and very focused on what had been revealed to him to be his role. We are told that he lived in the desert and he ate only locusts and honey. And we are even told what he wore, clothes of camel hair and a leather belt. And we know that he was very focused on his message. His message to the crowds who came to see him were very specific. To tax collectors, he said, do not take more than is legal. To soldiers, presumably Roman or in Roman employ, he said not to extort money and be satisfied with their wages. And to others, he said, if you have more than you need, then share your property with those who do not have sufficient. Well, this message is relevant in our time, but in John time, John's time, it would be meeting current issues. 
at that time, forces from Rome were expanding their control over huge, huge swathes of the Middle East. And their modus operandi was to strip the assets of the areas they invaded, send all that treasure and jewellery and goods back to Rome, and then introduce a method of ruling where everything had a price. A misdemeanour could be forgotten, in inverted commas, for a price and it had become established as an acceptable way of living. Paying for a misdemeanour or even offering a sacrifice was certainly not the repentance which the Jewish faith required. If anyone came to John for baptism, then they had to show that their behaviour had changed, that the baptism was only part of the process of forgiveness and the welcome back to God. Reading through the Gospels, it would seem that John knew that he had to bring people back to the straight and narrow. He would see the corrupt behaviour which had become an accepted part of society. And we read in Matthew's version how he became really forceful in his message, calling the spectators snakes, accusing them of thinking that they could trade on the fact that they were descended from Abraham to be accepted by God and forgiven. Think again, says John. He threatened them with harsh punishment if they did not repent. But this was all John knew. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The law of Moses. Wrongdoing being addressed by harsh punishment. People were trying to make sense of John. Who was he? Why had he come? Was he from God? Was he Elijah? Was he the Messiah? Was he the prophet? No, John says, I'm the person who fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah. I am the voice of someone crying in the desert, make way for the Lord. And John's response of saying repeatedly, I am not the Messiah, I am not Elijah, sets the scene for later in the book of John when Jesus eventually says who he is. It balances the story or the narrative. Using the so-called I am phrases, we read later in the book of John when Jesus spells out exactly who he is and what his purpose is. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the vine. John was leading the way, exposing the sinful nature which had become entrenched in the society at the time. He was harsh and he threatened retribution in order to make people see the error of their ways. He did not know who was coming after him. He only knew that someone was, and that was until he saw Jesus and suddenly realised that this was the person who would baptise with the Holy Spirit, where he had been baptising with water. And at the very end of our reading from John today, we have that confirmed. We are told that after preaching, Jesus saw, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John had summed up the person he saw, his cousin in the message of the Passover lamb. Little did he know that the person he was trailblazing was coming, not coming with harsh retribution, but with a different message. Not punishment, not harshness, but with love and forgiveness and understanding. John led the way. He prepared the way, just as Isaiah had predicted. He held a mirror up to people and said, what are you doing? You're not obeying the essence of God's law. It doesn't matter how you disguise it as accepted practice, but you are not obeying the moral, moral and ethical laws laid down by Moses. What would we see, or what do we see, if we hold a mirror up to our way of living and behaving as an individual, as a church, and as a society. 
as we embrace 2024 and all that is to happen in this year for us as individuals, as a church and as a society. We should hold that mirror in front of us at all times and call out when we are not reflecting the way God would have us live, just as John would have had us do. Only then can we work on our journey back to God's way and the teaching of Jesus. Amen. How might we pray for others beyond the usual words we expect and hear regularly? How might we pray for others deep down where we expect something different, trust something deeper? In that place, we pray for the world, a place where epiphanies happen for the hungry and the poor, an epiphany for leaders of the world, for those places of conflict and fear, an aha moment for the warmongers and for those who are trafficked and migrant, an insight about humanity for the traffickers. We dare a revelation, a vision that moves the world from the fear and pain it knows into the fullness of life. And that it begins here, with us, now. How might we pray for others, daringly, imaginatively, unwrapping something about you, our God, each time? about love in our communities, hope in our friendships and family, peace for the ill, physically and mentally, that we might be a safe place for the abused. How might we pray for others with our very selves? All our prayers. Each and every thought we offer to you, our God. Amen. Let us dedicate our offering. We dedicate ourselves to unravelling your mystery and revealing your love and justice, your presence and possibility. May we take away the layers of culture and reveal who you are for this world today. Remove the prejudice of our traditions that have always limited you and let the world see a God who is renewing this world, this new year, this new day. We dedicate ourselves to reveal your wonder and make known your truth and invite your blessing on the world and each one of us. Amen. And let us join together in the family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Beauty for brokenness Hope for despair Lord, in the suffering This is our prayer Bread for the children Justice, joy, peace Sunrise to sunset Your kingdom increase Shelter for fragile lives Cure for their ills Work for the craftsmen Trade for their skills Land for the dispossessed 
Rights for the weak, voices to plead the cause of those who can't speak. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion. We pray, melt our cold hearts. The tears fall like rain. Come, change our love. Thank you for joining in our worship today. So as we move forward in this new year, revealing you, God of all, through Jesus, our friend, as we walk on this journey, this day, this week, this year, we know that we will walk with the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Keep you. May the Lord make his 
Shine upon.